Go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy to get 20% off your first month of cognitive behavioral therapy with weekly sessions online with a therapist in addition to worksheets, a journal, meditation and yoga videos and unlimited messaging. There's strong evidence that CBT can help people who hoard and accessing therapy online can be affordable and accessible. Find out more and get your discount at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash online therapy. Now on Broadway, an enemy of the people is a New York Times critic's pick. Jeremy Strong is one of the great actors of his generation, hails the Chicago Tribune. In a performance, the Wall Street Journal praises as powerfully affecting and bitterly funny. Michael Imperioli sets off sparks, cheers the Hollywood Reporter. Victoria Pedretti is luminous, raves variety. From director Sam Gold and playwright Amy Herzog, an enemy of the people is urgent, electrifying, and haunting, declares USA Today. An enemy of the people, on Broadway through June 16th only. Hey, I'm Ryan Reynolds. Recently, I asked Mint Mobile's legal team if big wireless companies are allowed to raise prices due to inflation. They said yes. And then when I asked if raising prices technically violates those onerous two-year contracts, they said, what the f*** are you talking about, you insane Hollywood ass!" So to recap, we're cutting the price of Mint Unlimited from $30 a month to just $15 a month. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. I'm Sandra, and I'm just the professional your small business was looking for. But you didn't hire me because you didn't use LinkedIn jobs. LinkedIn has professionals you can't find anywhere else, including those who aren't actively looking for a new job, but might be open to the perfect role, like me. In a given month, over 70% of LinkedIn users don't visit other leading job sites. So if you're not looking on LinkedIn, you'll miss out on great candidates like Sandra. Start hiring professionals like a professional. Post your free job on linkedin.com slash spoken today. Welcome to the Overcome Compulsive Hoarding with That Hoarder podcast. I am drowning in stuff and trying to find a way out. Listen as I explore the issues and delve deep as somebody profoundly affected by hoarding disorder. Find out more, including links to subscribe to the podcast and all my social media at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. Finally, I am not a doctor. I'm just a hoarder doing her best. So do seek professional support if and when you need it. So I'm going to start this week with... A success of the week and a weird dilemma of the week. This is an occasional series and it is where it's kind of self-evident. I think the success of the week is a way of encouraging myself, giving myself a bit of a yay and also hopefully encouraging you that successes can happen. The weird dilemma of the week is that in my life, there's no body really that I can tell my weird hoarding dilemmas to. And so this is just a really good opportunity to share some of the absolute weirdness that goes on in my head. And I know from messages I get that a lot of you can really relate to the weird dilemmas. So yeah, so let's do it. So my success of the week this week I walked past a cute little shelving unit that someone had left on the street and I left it where it was. I hesitated. I'm not going to pretend this was a straightforward interaction. It was really cute and pretty and I wanted to find a use for it because it was there and free and nice. I had a really good look at it because I think I was thinking, well, if you can think of a precise place for it to live and a precise use that it can serve, then you can take it home. And I stood there for ages because I could not think of a precise place for it to live and there was not a precise use for it. So I stood there for a good while. Thankfully, there was no one around desperately trying to think of one. So I had an excuse to bring it home, but I didn't think of one. And because I couldn't think of where it would live or what precisely it would do, I left it where it was. 
And I like to think that somebody else passed it later and took it and it made them very happy. So that is my success of the week. My weird dilemma of the week. I'm, it, I don't think it quite falls into the category dilemma, to be honest, but it, it was a weird hoarder situation of the week. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to rename this segment, but my weird hoarder situation of the week. I had a giant bag of stuff to donate to the charity shop and it was in the boot of the car and it had been in the boot of the car for a few weeks and I kept not donating it, not because I wanted to keep the things. I had very firmly decided that I wasn't even going to open the bag. Everything in the bag had been through a bit of a process to get there. So I felt confident that it had all been checked several times. Hopefully I'll get to a point where I don't have to check things several times. But as it was, they had been checked several times. I was confident that the things in there should go. So so I put it in the boot of the car. And then the thing that was delaying me was the practicality. I needed to find a charity shop where you could park directly outside because this is a really big bag, like one of those laundry bags. I wouldn't be able to carry it any distance. And most charity shops where I live don't have parking straight outside. They're in like, you know, in the middle of a bunch of other shops with, with no parking outside. So I needed to work out the practicality of how to do it. And then I found one charity shop with parking outside and I thought, right, there we are. That's the one. So yesterday I drove over there and I got there and I parked up outside and I got the giant bag out of the boot and I took it in and I said, I've brought a donation. And the woman said, what's in it? Because we're only taking. And then my brain froze Uh because of all the outcomes I had imagined, none of them had been the charity shop turning you away because you're trying to donate something they've got too much of. And I absolutely panicked because I had no plan B. This is meant to be the very final step of this particular de-hoarding. I was anxious because I I didn't know where (laughs) what else I would do, where else I would go with this stuff. And everything froze. And then I kind of came back to earth and waited to see what she said next. We will only take, and she said, adult clothing. And I thought, oh, thank goodness for that. Because 90% of that bag is, is, is my clothes and I'm an adult. Um, so I said, there are some shoes in there. She said, that's fine. I said, otherwise it's all clothes, but there's a bit of stationery. And she said, that's fine. So I'm wondering whether they've just got too many books and CDs and DVDs at the moment. So thankfully, I was able to leave the giant bag of donations because had I had to take it back out to the car and put it back in the boot and come up with a whole new plan, I don't know, could have been in there for another six months. So yeah, weird situation of the week. I managed to donate the giant bag of stuff, but not without having a mini heart attack in the process. But you know what? That just leaves space in my boot to start filling the next giant laundry bag of stuff. And I'm actually looking forward to it. It felt good to donate it. It felt good to get rid of it, first of all, to make that bit of space. It felt good that I was helping a charity and that they would get some much needed income from my things. And it felt good that it would help a number of women who maybe are a bit broke or maybe just like buying second hand or maybe a bit of both who would be able to get some clothes that they don't have to buy new. It keeps them out of landfill. It's if other people buy those things in the charity shop, then they might buy less from the kind of fast fashion brands. It's all a really good process. And 
I've done a whole episode before on making sure you only donate actually good things and not donating your crap, basically. I also talked about in that episode, which I will link to in the show notes at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. I also talked about there are some charity shops that will take like rags and scraps and torn things to sell by weight but not all do. And so make sure you check. And I didn't go there. Everything I donated was in good condition. Some of it, I'm ashamed to say, still had the original labels and tags on. So I feel confident that everything I gave them was suitable for resale. And I hope that's the case because because I, you know, they're, they're busy people and I don't want to cost them any additional work. But if the charity gets some money from it and some people get some cheap clothes from it and I get a little bit more space from it, it feels like a real positive all round. So yay that my bag of stuff fell into the category of stuff that they were accepting. I may have to ring them in the future to check what they're accepting so as to not have to go through that again. So I went on holiday and I had a few kind of revelations when I was there and when I got back about my hoarding. And there's something quite revealing about staying somewhere other than your home for a few days and what that tells you about the home you live in. So that's what I want to talk about today. So I went to a tiny village in the middle of the countryside. It was absolutely beautiful. It was good for my soul. It got me away from it all for a few days. And it really did my mind a lot of good. I'm not very good at taking breaks. So I really needed it. And it was great. But it did highlight some things that that shone a light on the reality of my hoarding situation. Now, because I was going to the countryside rather than on a city break, say, I was more anxious than I would have been on a city break about what if I need something when I'm there and I don't have it. So this was the first thing I learned was that that my anxiety about not having stuff extends to a few days away. Now, had I been on a city break, this would have been easier to manage. And I know this because that's the other kind of holiday I tend to have. And when you're in a city somewhere, even though you don't know the surroundings, you know that there are shops. And so if you've forgotten underwear (laughs) or, I don't know, shower gel, you can easily top up your supplies. If you're in the middle of the countryside, that involves driving into a nearby town or city to top up, which kind of kills the vibe and is a bit of a hassle and also created anxiety in me that it wasn't if I was short of something, it would not be easy to replace it, if I could replace it at all. Now, the thing with going away is there are certain things you absolutely have to take with you, and you will be in trouble without. If you're going abroad, one of those things is your passport. If you take prescription medication, that's another of those things that's really difficult to get hold of if you go somewhere else without it. And also money, whether that's in the form of cash or bank cards or Google Pay or Apple Pay on your phone. But generally speaking, those are the three things that you'd really, really, really struggle without. And other things are normally replaceable. I wasn't abroad, so I didn't need a passport. I had my bank cards and I checked about a million and a half times that I had my medication. But I 
was very anxious about everything else. I was convinced I would forget something. You'd think I was moving abroad for the amount of anxiety I had about what I might forget. I wasn't. I was going to the countryside for a few days and I wasn't camping or, you know, me against the elements. It was, um, I was staying in a house. It was all very civilized. And that anxiety meant that I over prepared to a pretty ridiculous degree. I took way more than I needed, way more than I needed. Thank goodness for the Kindle. That meant at least I didn't have to take 12 books or 120 books with me. They are all at least in the magic machine. So that was something. I didn't have to worry about running out of things to read. But I took, I don't know how many, like, phone chargers. I took loads of clothes. I took stuff like makeup that I hardly ever wear and certainly wasn't going to wear in the middle of the countryside. I decided I might write letters to my friends. And I did write a couple, but I took way more writing paper than I could realistically have used. It was just ridiculous. And then I stopped for food on the way there so I could get, you know, meals and ingredients and things for when I was away. And I did manage to be quite sensible with that. I just took a fairly regular amount. But the interesting thing about that was my anxiety about it. I took the right amount. I didn't have a load left when I left the holiday. I didn't run out before the holiday ended. However, my anxiety about running out was sky high, really, really, really high. And it's interesting because I did that episode, I think it was 62, about minimalism that became basically a self-therapy session. (laughs) I started talking and it went in places I wasn't expecting. And it really highlighted to me when I was doing when I was recording that, when I was speaking into this microphone, how much of an imprint a period of poverty had on me and whether that is at least in part responsible for my high anxiety about empty spaces. And during that period of my life, I was often hungry. And the thought of running out of food before the end of the holiday made me so anxious and while I got it right, that didn't stop me panicking throughout that I might have got it wrong. And bear in mind, I wasn't in the desert (laughs) hundreds of miles from other people. Even if I hadn't taken enough food, it would have been fine. The village had a cafe. I could have driven to a nearby town to go to a shop it would have been fine, but calming my anxiety down, what if I don't have enough, not just about food, but everything? What if I don't have enough changes of clothes? What if I don't have enough to read, even though my Kindle has, I don't know how many books on it? What if I want to write 12 letters to my friends? What if I want to charge sixth imaginary phone when I have one phone and more charges than I know what to do with? That what if, what if, what if, even just for a few days away, is so powerful in my mind. And having that change of scene and seeing that anxiety rise in that way was quite telling. But also, when you are away and there's not a whole lot you can do, I don't know, I flipped between that anxiety and then also a quite pleasant resignation. Like, well, if I've not got enough tops, I've not got enough tops. There's not a whole lot I can do about it. Like, it's just going to have to be fine because I'm here and I don't want to go shopping while I'm here. The whole point of being here is to switch off from the outside world. I don't want this to go wrong. And I and going wrong meant ending up having to go shopping on day three So there was a kind of freedom in, I might run out of something and I'll just have to deal. And there was an amount of terror in, I might run out of something and I'll just have to deal. Highlighted to me that I really still have work to do on this fear of 
running out of things, fear of not having something when I need it. And I do think that period of not having money when if I had, if I did run out of things, I genuinely couldn't replace it indefinitely. I think that period left more of a mark on my psyche than I had perhaps realized until I did the episode 62 <laughs> stream of consciousness. The second thing I learned on my trip away about my hoarding is that living even temporarily in a house where it's really easy to move around is lovely. So nice. Get out of bed and go to the bathroom and you're not going to fall over anything. You can cook your evening meal without having to move a load of stuff in order to get to the stove or in order to make space to chop your vegetables. And going from, oh, this is nice. It's nice to have this space. It's nice to be able to move around easily to, gosh, I could live like this. Felt like too big a leap. I appreciated it when I was there and would absolutely like that to be the case here. But it feels so far removed from my current reality that I couldn't connect with it as a realistic vision of my future. Felt like a nice dream, but then I would picture my house and I just can't even conceive of it looking like that, of it being like that. And that was really interesting because I enjoyed the space. It made me slightly anxious, but I enjoyed the ease of moving around. I enjoyed how little hassle there was in my day-to-day life, but I couldn't, I couldn't like place a transparency over my vision of my current house and imagine this house in that state. It was too far away. It was too different. So it didn't, it didn't connect with me as something to aspire to because it felt too distant from reality. But I did appreciate it when I was there and I made myself make a mental note of how much I appreciated it as hopefully a message to my future self when I get a bit closer, hopefully, to that being a potential reality. You know, to be able to see floor everywhere, all the floor, unless it had like a bed or a sofa on it, was just there. Can't even imagine it. But it was nice. I enjoyed it. The third thing I learned from my trip away was that getting home afterwards really highlighted the difference. If I thought that spending a few days somewhere with clear floors and a lot of space was a shock to the system. So getting home and being back in my usual environment was another shock to the system. It was seeing it through fresh eyes times 20, really. Things like I've got one, I've got a light bulb. I've got a couple of light bulbs that blew some time ago, but it has never felt quite like I have enough space to safely stick a chair in the middle of the floor and stand on it to replace the light bulb. Now, one of those is in a room I don't often use, so that's not much of an issue. But another is in a room I use a lot and I am 100% in the habit of using the torch on my phone, flashlight. I know that torch for some people means like a thing on fire. That's not what I'm talking about. And I've used the torch on my phone for that room for months. And when I was away, I would think, oh, I'm going to that particular room, I'd better get my phone and then realise that this was a normal place with lights that worked. And so getting back home and having to use the torch on my phone to go in that room when it's dark, having had a break away from doing that, I just thought, I hate living like this. Why am I living like this? This is so bad. Similarly, you know, just the state of the place, just how much more difficult everything is when you're living in a hoard, 
how much more difficult it is not just to get around, but to find things, to make progress with things, to have a chance at organising anything. Everything in a hoarded home is so much more difficult. And I knew it was difficult, but there's nothing like spending a few days somewhere else to really highlight the problem and make you see it in a way that you'd perhaps... I think when you're so familiar with something, you stop noticing it, don't you? And while this podcast means that I'm more aware of my hoarding on a consistent basis than I ever have been before, this still this still was a shock to the system, coming back home and going, oh God, do I really live like this? I'd seen the other side. I'd seen how it can be. And then I was plunged back into how it actually is. And it wasn't a nice awakening. I didn't enjoy coming back to to the place in this state. It's not nice. I don't like it. I'm overwhelmed. Every little bit I try and do feels like a drop in the ocean. It's such hard work. I'm doing it. As I always say to you, all progress is good progress. A laundry bag to the charity shop felt great. And then I saw how much was left to do and felt disheartened. And that, I think, is a cycle I'm going to keep going through. And I have to just say, okay, I recognize that you feel disheartened, but don't let that cause you to stop. But getting back from holiday was disheartening. You can't live in denial when you're faced quite so bleakly with how things are compared to how they could be and should be. And the fourth thing I learnt was that tidying up at the end was so quick and easy. It is so much easier to clean and tidy somewhere that is already clean and tidy. It was so easy to keep on top of washing the dishes. It was so easy to keep on top of wiping a surface after I'd used it because it was just those dishes. It wasn't a backlog of three weeks dishes or the surface was clear. So it was really easy to wipe it rather than having to navigate tons of old toasters and slow cookers and whatever else is on the surfaces at home. We all know, don't we, that it's easier to clean and maintain somewhere that's that's neat, but it, it really, really is. I lived it. I wanted to leave the place in a, you know, a decent state. And that was so easy. It took minutes to make it look fine. Trying to maintain and improve and stay on top of things when it's chaos is so much harder work. And maybe there's a lesson in there. I I sometimes fear succeeding at dehoarding in case I then just rehoard again because maintaining is hard. But that trip away made me wonder if maintaining would be less hard than I'm imagining because I would be maintaining from a much, from a place that was much easier to manage rather than maintaining from the current, which is so nightmarish and chaotic that, that of course it's impossible. So maybe my anxiety that I don't, I don't not take action in case I dehoard and then relapse. It, I'm not that defeatist, but it is an ongoing worry in the back of my head. What if I'm putting all this work in for a temporary fix? I did one of my early episodes was about this idea that hoarding has a, I think it's a 97% recidivism rate and knowing, well, hearing that put me off even bothering to try for several years. What's the point? If only 3% of people can maintain it, why bother putting the work in now? That what I found when I was researching that episode, which I will link to in the show notes, but was basically that there was no apparent source of that statistic. Um, it didn't seem to come from 
any study that I could find, but the, the general feeling was doing it through force or doing it without the necessary support or doing it without understanding what went wrong in the first place is what causes people to relapse. And doing it with support, doing it with your eyes open, doing it with knowledge and determination and hope puts you in a better position for success. And I hope that's correct. If you've been having that same dilemma, I don't know if it's just me, have a listen to that episode, which um, I'll link to at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk. So it was, it was an interesting experience. It was lovely to get away. It was the, I really needed the break and being surrounded by beautiful things is just good for my soul. But it's interesting how even away from my hoarded home, I spent at least some of the time preoccupied with hoarding. This thing is really pernicious and it's hard work and it's really ingrained in our brains. It's hard to tune out of that after so many years of being in it. And I think I'm trying and I think you're trying and that's why you're listening. And I hope we can get there. I can't say we are definitely 100% going to get there because that would be disingenuous because I've no idea. But I think that between us, we're doing the right things. And it might be slower than we'd hoped, or it might be harder than we'd imagined. But all progress is progress. And, and all we can do is keep chipping away at this. It's tough stuff. It really is. Ryan Reynolds here from Mint Mobile. With the price of just about everything going up during inflation, we thought we'd bring our prices down. So to help us, we brought in a reverse auctioneer, which is apparently a thing. Mint Mobile Unlimited Premium Wireless. How to get 30, 30, how to get 30, how to get 20, 20, 20, how to get 20, 20, how to get 15, 15, 15, 15, just 15 bucks a month? So Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash switch. $45 up front for three months plus taxes and fees. Promote for new customers for limited time. Unlimited more than 40 gigabytes per month. Slows full terms at mintmobile.com. Cool fact, a crocodile can't stick out its tongue. Also, you can get health insurance for a month or just under a year in some states. United Healthcare short term insurance plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget friendly coverage for you. Learn more at uh1.com. So, I've been asking listeners what their hoarding confessions are. I feel like this entire podcast is my hoarding confession. <laughs> From start to finish, it's me telling you my secret confessions. And because hoarding is so stigmatized and because a lot of us keep it secret from other people, I think a lot of us have things that are eating away at us because we can't tell anyone. Or it may be that some people know about our hoarding, but there are still things that we feel we have to keep secret because they're just too much or too real, or too scary. And so I set up a form where people can anonymously tell me their secret. I have no way of knowing who sends in what. It doesn't tell me the email address or the IP address or anything of the people who fill in the form. It just, I get a spreadsheet at the other end that has the date and time a comment was left and the comment. That's all the information I get. And so I asked people if they wanted to share their hoarding secret to do so at overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk slash secret. And some of you have done, and I think that's so amazing and so brave. I love that you're trusting me because I'm kind of trusting you as well. And we're in it together to some degree. And the other reason I love that you're doing it is because I make it clear every time I mention it on the podcast and on the form itself, that if you send me your secret, it's it's so that I can read it out on the show. And I know some people find it quite kind of cleansing if their secret is read out. 
some people, that would be their worst nightmare. And of course, that is fine. Don't send me your secret in that case. But for those who do want to share their secret, it's really profound that we can get this stuff out. So I got one from somebody, no idea who, and it's a bit different. It's not a secret as such, but I wanted to read it out because it it wowed me a bit. So it says, Hello, that hoarder. I am not writing with a secret, but rather with a thank you. You put a lot of work into making your podcasts, and sometimes you may wonder who is out there listening. So I am here to offer my story. I have been feeling really desperate and overwhelmed. My landlord gave me a deadline to dehoard. It felt like facing an insurmountable, impossible task, and I did not know even where to begin. I discovered that two of the biggest challenges were, one, the voices in my head, telling me what a bad person I was for getting myself into this situation, and two, the awfulness of being totally alone, because I really did not have anyone I could turn to about this, my shame is so crippling. I found your podcast recently through an online search and I started listening while I work at the exhausting, draining task of dehoarding. Thank you for all the perspectives and practical advice you provide. What I also discovered along the way is that your voice provides a remarkable companionship while I dehoard. I know you truly understand my situation. You know what I'm going through. You have experienced emotions similar to mine. I started to re-listen to your podcasts. Some days I listen to your voice for six hours or more. It doesn't matter that I have heard a podcast more than once. There's a wonderful comfort in the familiarity of your voice and I don't feel alone anymore, so part of the battle is won. Slowly, I am making progress at dehoarding. I can see the difference, and I have removed, recycled, and donated quite a bit of material from my space. There is still a very, very long way to go, but slowly I trudge up the hill, now more with grim determination instead of with anxiety. Your podcast, your voice and auditory presence have made an enormous difference in my life. Thank you for accompanying me on this challenging journey. So, hi, whoever you are, thank you so much for this. I really appreciate that you've trusted me with this. I'm really sorry you find yourself in this situation. It does feel desperate and overwhelming and getting a deadline from your landlord is is scary. You have all my luck and good wishes to keep making progress. It sounds like you're making amazing progress. It does feel insurmountable. It does feel impossible. And I'm so glad you found the podcast and I'm so glad that it's helping you through this super stressful time. It feels really nice to know that I'm in a disembodied way helping you through this process. It feels really nice to know that the hours and hours and it is hours and hours that go into this are having a material impact on somebody's life and that it's helping you dehoard. That is all that I want is for this to help people dehoard. I want it to help me dehoard as well. This isn't an entirely selfless project, but I love that what I'm trying to do is working for you. I love that the work that goes into it is having that impact on a listener. I 
I'm so glad you told me. I'm so glad you can see the difference in the progress you've made. And sure, there's a long way to go, but just think how much further on you are now than you were even a couple of weeks ago. That's incredible. There's so much potential in what you're doing. And if my voice and my words help, that's then use them. Keep listening, keep replaying, keep restreaming, keep re-downloading as long as you need to. I do recommend people listen to episodes more than once because I, if it's a solo episode like this, I plan it to some degree, sometimes quite rigid, not rigidly, but sometimes I have quite a clear outline. Other times it's more of a general few notes. And then obviously I record it and then I edit it and then I go through the transcript. So by the time an episode goes live, I've been through the content a number of times. And with interview episodes, similar really, I plan them. That includes researching the topic I'm going to be talking with the interviewee about and planning questions. And then obviously record the interview and then edit that and then go through the transcript of that. So again, by the time they go out, I've listened to them several times and every time I hear something new, even though I was in the conversation myself. It might be that I'm talking to Dr. Jan Eppingstall about something and then I edit the audio and think, I don't even remember that, her saying that. Or it might be that I edit the audio and then I'm transcribing it and only then really notice something she said. So re-listening is valid. And I certainly have podcasters. I listen to a lot of podcasts and there are certainly podcasters in my life who I find like a really comforting presence. And sometimes it doesn't even matter what they're saying. I just like having their voices there. It's quite soothing. And I'm glad I can be that for you. And I hope I can be that for other people. But mostly, thank you so much for sending me that message, me- message. Sorry, if you can hear back fireworks in the background, um, it is bonfire night, which is a night in the UK. Basically, a guy many centuries ago tried to blow up the Houses of Parliament and failed. And on the 5th of November, we have bonfires and fireworks. Nobody quite knows whether it's to celebrate the attempt to blow up Parliament or whether it's to celebrate him failing. But there's a lot of fireworks going on behind me. So if the microphone is picking those up, apologies about that. I've been thinking about how many of us have to keep our hoarding secret. I will get to the top tip of the week in a sec, but just for a moment, let's talk secrets. I certainly keep my hoarding secret, and I've been wondering about the effect that these secrets and this shame have on us and our mental health. I'm thinking of doing an episode about the secrets we keep about our hoarding. And if you feel comfortable, I want to hear your hoarding secrets. I've created a form where you can submit your secrets anonymously. I will not know who sends what. If you want to tell me your secret for a potential future episode, go to Overcome Compulsive Hoarding dot co dot uk slash secret. That's overcome compulsive hoarding dot co dot uk slash secret. Now back to your top tip. So my top tip this week is a mini clip from the Daily Pep podcast. I have used a mini clip from this podcast before as a top tip because Meg Kissack, who does the podcast is a marvel. It's a lovely podcast that I strongly recommend subscribing to. Episodes are only a couple of minutes long and it's just, it's just lovely. Feel good. I will link to the Daily Pep in the show notes, but this is what Meg has to say. Your best is going to look different every single day. And I think life would be 
a whole lot easier and a whole lot more joyful if we could really lean into that rather than expecting to operate on beast mode every single day which we know is not achievable is not realistic and it is definitely not sustainable and is going to lead to burnout. I appreciate that there can be benefits in beast mode but if we want to keep going which we do it's not the way forward okay thank you for listening and i will speak to you next time thank you for listening to the overcome compulsive hoarding podcast you can find more online at overcome compulsive hoarding.co.uk you can find me on twitter at that hoarder and on facebook at overcome compulsive hoarding with that hoarder To find out more about how you can support this podcast and the overall project, go to overcomecompulsivehoarding.co.uk forward slash support and do subscribe to this podcast so you make sure you don't miss any future episodes. If there's one thing that my family and friends know me for, it's being an amazing gift giver. I owe it all to Celebrations Passport from 1-800-Flowers.com, my one-stop shopping site that has amazing gifts for every occasion. With Celebrations Passport, I get free shipping on thousands of amazing gifts. And the more gifts I give, the more perks and rewards I earn. To learn more and take your gift giving to the next level, visit 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. Hey everyone, Craig Robinson here. I want you to check out the Ways to Win podcast brought to you by Ford and the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. On Ways to Win, Coach Cal and I will discuss leadership lessons we've learned. We know all about the days spent perfecting your craft outside of the limelight and have knowledge to share about how strength, inspiration, encouragement, and adaptability are the key ingredients to drive toward your dreams. And those same ingredients can be found in the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. So check out my podcast, Ways to Win, and also check out the new 2024 Ford F-150 truck. Learn more at Ford.com. Built Ford tough, built Ford proud.